Let me welcome everyone on behalf of Seed Business School. Uh, my name is Andras Karpati, and together with Robert, we will be your host today. Uh, this is already our sixth event of our webinar series. We have started early May, and we have two more sessions to go until the end of June. So if you're interested, check out our website and register. Uh, as usual, before we start, I would like to give you some technical information. Um, we have now muted your microphones, but during the session, you, will, you are free to ask any questions via the chat icon at the bottom of the screen. And you can also let us know if you face any technical issues. Following the presentation, there will be a moderated Q&A session where I will read your questions and Robert will answer them directly. And in case we'll have time, we would also like to open the floor for live questions with your voice and camera on, just like last week. So if you would like to ask a question that way, uh, please click on raise hand under the participant list and I will give you the word during the Q&A session. Please also know that your names or device names are visible to everyone. If you want to change it, you may do so under the three dots next to your name. For seeing the slides better, you can minimize the participant window in the top right corner. At the end of the, at the, end of the session, um, as usual, we would like to ask your quick opinion about how much did you enjoy the webinar. So make sure you stick around for a few seconds at the end. We plan to finish at around 5 p.m., but um, depending on your questions and the discussion, we are happy to stay with you for another 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, so let me introduce uh, quickly our topic uh, and presenter for today. Um, many people look at their jobs as JOBs, meaning not much more than the place they spend their time from nine to five. Other people, however, those behaving as owners, make a difference in performance. The difference between the two sets of people is ownership mentality. It's not talent or strengths, but rather, rather an attitude so the case is not that some people inherently have it and some don't. The good news is that this can be developed. Our presenter is Robert Hussar, uh, who is an experienced leader with, uh, who held senior management positions in both retail and wholesale banking in the past 20 plus years. He's an economist by education and also has an MBA from Manchester Business School in the UK. Robert served as head of consumer banking department responsible for branch sales and deputy CEO responsible for corporate banking at Raiffeisen Bank. And after 16 years spent at Raiffeisen, he became the head of corporate and institutional banking division at K&H Bank. Today, he acts as a management consultant and is involved with fintech startups. He's an active faculty member at Seed Business School since 2016. Roby, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Andres. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Welcome everyone to this, to this webinar. It is a great pleasure for me to talk about this topic with you. And um, I decided actually that I, I have had enough of this coronavirus stuff uh, in the last couple of weeks. I, I, I think many of us are in the same way. So it's, uh, please, uh, be warned that this presentation and this webinar is going to be a coronavirus free area. Uh, it means also that this topic is equally applicable now, tomorrow, one month from now, one year from now, and even a decade from now. So take it as such, please. So what we are going to discuss today. Um, first of all, uh, we need to de define what we mean by ownership behavior. Also important to know whether we can measure it or not. Uh, maybe you recall this phrase, I know it when I see it. It comes from a US Supreme Court judge uh, named Potter Stewart uh, from the early 60s. And it was actually about a case involving pornography in the United States. And in, in front of the court, they wanted to define what pornography is. And this guy, Supreme Court Justice, said that he, he knows it when he sees it. So the question is whether it is the case with, with ownership behavior or not. Then we need to know uh, what are the key characteristics of the people who demonstrate this behavior. And last but not least, I would like to give you some advice how to put it into practice. So let's start with our first topic, behaving as owners. And immediately, I would like to invite you uh, to participate in our poll. 
my question is to you, whether you drive, maintain, and take care of your company car, let's assume you have one, the same way as you do with your own. The choices you have are yes or no, so please vote now. Okay, results are pouring in. Okay, let's wait a couple of more seconds. Still, we are getting answers. Basically, the ratios are not changing recently. Uh, as expected, 86% uh, of the people said yes, uh, that they take that car the same way as the, their own. And there is a minority uh, who said that uh, they treat it differently. Okay, let's not judge and let's not qualify these responses. I think this uh, were just a nice icebreaker for our topics. But let's dive in. Let's dive into uh, the behaviors of employees and, and owners. And let's make this uh, quite uh, extreme example. So on the one hand, the employees, they typically demonstrate some kind of a short-term transactional thinking in their approach to their daily jobs. So they come to work, they do what is expected of them. Hopefully, uh, some people don't do even that. Uh, and when the working hours are over, they just leave. Obviously, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the average employees in general. On the other hand, we have the, we have the owners. The owners, they have a completely different thinking. And those uh, people of ours who behave like that, they also uh, act completely differently from the typical employee. And I would say that this is more of a long-term systemic thinking. Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, I, I worked with an uh, Hungarian company, uh, which was involved in uh, food supply uh, to schools and, 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 uh, and hospitals. And uh, we were doing the annual budgeting. I think most of you are quite familiar uh, with this exercise. It was in the middle of the summer and we were doing the budgeting for the next, next year and the owner came in and wanted to participate in the in the budgeting session and when we were discussing how much we would be spending next year on fuel for the trucks that were delivering the food uh, to the school Uh, an aha moment and I didn't take it as a sign of micromanagement because it was not the intention of the guy it was the sign how deeply he was involved with his own company and how much he was thinking in terms of money from his own pocket when we were discussing expenses so I think that illustrates pretty nicely uh, the, the uh, the difference between the two types of approach, the employee and the owner. So bearing this in mind, let's try and define what we mean by ownership behavior. So people who behave like owners, they can do it when they think and act like owners. But for that, they need to, need to have this feeling that they have an equal role in achieving the results of the company. And they also need to see the connection between their actions, their contributions, and the, the success of the company. And if people behave like that and, and have this in mind, then we can reap a lot of benefits uh, from these people. The big question I think is that what really makes the difference? And it was already mentioned in Andras's introduction that in my opinion, the difference is actually the mindset of the people that drives their, uh, their attitude, that affects their behavior, that determines what actions they take, and their actions actually provide the results which contribute to the performance, their performance and the company's performance. So my first most important message to you that we are looking for mindset, uh, ownership mindset. You can also call it ownership mentality. These are semantics, but I think you get uh, what I mean. So let's move on and let's discuss whether we can measure ownership mentality, ownership mindset 
or even ownership behavior. And the bad news is that we cannot. Uh, this is not really good news because we know from the management axiom that you can manage what you measure and what can we do if we cannot manage, uh, we cannot measure this stuff. We can use a proxy and the best proxy I found is engagement and employee engagement uh, is a well-known measure these days uh, in the corporate world. The guys at Gallup are the most prominent uh, contributors to this field of study. And in these measurements, we typically uh, differentiate amongst three types of employees. The first one, the Luddites. You know, these are the guys, they were the guys in the early 19th century, um, specifically in the cotton and woolen mill industries who started to destroy the machinery because they were afraid that those machineries were taking their jobs. And I think history repeats itself these days with technology. The second category of workers, I would call them slackers. They are there, but um, as we can see on the tombstone of the famous Hungarian writer, he is a Gardoni, uh, it is said on his tombstone that his body only. And with this type of employees, they are there in the workplace, but only in body, not in spirit and not in mind. So they are not present in the real sense of the word. And last but not least, we have the stars who are actually uh, doing most of the work. In the parlance of, of employee engagement, this is how they are called, actively disengaged people, not engaged people, and engaged people. And all over the world, uh, the distribution typically follows this famous bell curve, the normal distribution. So much so that the overall worldwide statistics show us that we have 15% actively disengaged people, 67% not engaged, two thirds of the people are not engaged, and the remaining 18% are the engaged ones. There are some regional variances, uh, but not much, uh, except for uh, United States and Canada, where you can see that the uh, actively disengaged people are double uh, what the figure is worldwide, it's 30%. Uh, that's clearly an outlier, so it's, uh, it's a big job for the leaders in, in the United States. But in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, the variances are, are, are very small. So we can say that this is what you can expect in your companies as well. And this is not a very, very good picture. When 85% of the people, uh, not 85, 82% uh, of the people, so it's four-fifth of the people, they are not really contributing to your uh, results. Furthermore, 15% uh, of them are actually destroying. They have a negative effect uh, on your results. So just imagine if you could change this picture and if you could create more and more engaged people in your organizations. And this is what uh, shifting the people to the ownership mindset would actually mean for you. So let's move on and see uh, what the people, what the key characteristics you can observe in the people who has this ownership mindset. So what is the right stuff? There are four major uh, topics I would like to discuss here one by one. So you need people with a broad view you need people who are entrepreneurial, you need people who are accountable, and you need people who show potential. Let's take these four one by one. First, the broad view. This, in other words, basically means that they get the big picture. So they understand how the business works, they are aware of the priorities, uh, and they know what contributions they make to the company's success, also for the long term. Then you have the benefits uh, of these characteristics uh, with these people. If I can give you two examples to show two rather extreme behaviors uh, resulting from the mindset. Uh, in the banking industry, when you have a universal bank, meaning that uh, you have both retail banking and, and corporate banking, it's a natural tendency that you want cross sales between the two divisions. And one of the tools for that is the so-called employee package, when the corporate banking people are expected to sell 
retail banking products to the employees of the large corporate customers. At uh, KNH Bank, uh, when I joined, that it was actually just not happening. And it took me two years uh, to get the people, the corporate people to sell this product. And the only way I could achieve it was a very detailed KPI set, measuring on a monthly basis, every key account manager, how much they sold in this category uh, and making it part of the annual bonus scheme. So that was the only way I could get the people to sell, sell this product. Whereas in Raiffeisen Bank before, it just worked. So we, when we introduced the product in retail banking and we told the corporate guys that guys, please start selling this product. They understood it immediately, how important it was to the bank and just sold it. Because they realized that they had the same logo on the business card as the retail people. Okay, let's move on to the next one, which is entrepreneurialism. So these kind of the kind of people, they are the ones who actually go the extra mile. Uh, they know what they are good at, and they relentlessly pursue their, those activities in which they are, they are typically good. But they also are aware of their weaknesses, uh, but, that, that, but that they are not afraid of help, asking for help. That's, that's really, really important. Most of us just shy away uh, from asking for help because then we think that uh, it will reflect negatively on us, uh, but it just does not. And last but not least, these people are okay with change. Sometimes people say that they love change and they embrace change and, and things like that. I'm not always buying that. Uh, I think if people are okay with change, I think that's good enough. And then you can trust these people to work hard and being enthusiastic uh, and uh, taking risk because they are not afraid of making mistakes. Again, if I'm using uh, my banking uh, past, uh, uh, looking for examples, uh, at KNH Bank, uh, when we took deals to the credit committee, by the way, Credit committee is the ultimate decision-making body for large ticket deals, so big loans. For companies, it is decided at the credit committee. So when people brought uh, their applications to the, to the credit committee, they only brought those ones uh, which had at least an 80% chance of approval. And this was because uh, it was seen in the bank unprofessional to bring uh, those deals to the credit committee which were question mark or, or borderline, if you like. And people were afraid to make this kind of mistakes. In, in Raiffeisen Bank, uh, we always encourage the people to, broad, to bring a broad set of deals to the credit committee as much as they can professionally accept to present to the, to the board. Uh, and we ask them to let us in the credit committee to, to decide what the loan appetite, the risk appetite the bank should be. And if they brought this, which we rejected, we didn't reprimand them. We didn't tell them they did a bad job. We just explained them why we didn't like those deals. Okay, moving on to the next one, accountability. You need people who do not shy away from, or even I, I risk to say, uh, embrace taking responsibility for their actions, for their decisions, uh, for their commitments, and uh, for their relationships, how to manage uh, those things. You definitely these, need these characteristics uh, if you want people who know what they are doing, who know what they are authorized to do, what is within, within their capabilities, and what is within their authority. And when it is outside of those, they know that they need to come to you for guidance or, or maybe in a minority of the cases uh, for decisions. Uh, if you have people who embrace accountability, then they, uh, when they make a mistake, they don't shy away from it. They are forthcoming, they accept the mistakes, uh, they are okay with the consequences because they already started to think about or even take remedy elections. Uh, so to, to repair the situation. Uh, accountability, uh, it's, it's very, very important. It frees up people actually in, in many ways. 
For example, a couple of years ago, uh, the complaint handling procedure was fully centralized at, at Raiffeisen Bank, which meant that if a customer had a complaint uh, in person, in, by email or by the telephone, everything was channeled into a central department and it was their job to resolve the customer complaints. And one day I, I asked the controlling department to calculate how much it cost for us to resolve a customer complaint. And using the activity-based costing methodology, they came up with the figure of 15 euros, that it cost on average for the bank 15 euros to solve a customer complaint. And um, what I decided is that I delegated the authority to the branch managers and the head of the call center to resolve on spot all customer complaints when the customer wanted 15 euros or less for the alleged mistake of the bank. And uh, some people in the bank were afraid that it will result in, a, in an outflow of money because the front office people would give back the customer all the money they could. But after half a year, we measured what happened and the results were quite interesting because we spent less money on reimbursing the customers than before this, this authority was granted to the, to the front office people and all stakeholders were happier. So the, the, the people in the bank, they felt empowered uh, with this decision. But furthermore, the customer satisfaction with the complaint handling procedure of the bank improved. So it was a very, very interesting experience. Okay, moving on. Last one, potential. You basically need people with capacity to grow. So how we check for potential? Actually, here at SEED, during our business leadership program, we teach our participants the hallmarks of potential, which are motivation, curiosity, insight, engagement, and determination. You are looking for these uh, characteristics in the people, and at the business leadership program, we actually discuss and, and, and teach uh, the participants how to, how to do this. Because if you have people who have the potential, then you have people who are actually not satisfied with mediocre results. They want to do their best. But they have to take the calculated risk. So they measured what's at stake and they know what they can do. And they are able to grow into the role. To grow into the role. To be honest, uh, almost all the times when I promoted the Triface and Bank, where I spent most of my banking careers, uh, 16 years, I always felt that I was promoted earlier than I, than I deserved it. So it's uh, after two years in the bank, I was promoted to, to the middle management and they told me that this was the, the, the fastest time that somebody was promoted to, to middle management. And I felt that it was a little bit too early. What gave it to me was actually increased motivation because I wanted to justify the decision of the board I wanted to show that they made the right decision uh, when they promoted me. And a couple of years later, when uh, the bank introduced uh, the so-called award of excellence, which was basically a manager of the year type of award, I was the first manager who, who got, this, got this award. Uh, enough of my bragging uh, and enough of my, my monologue. So let me invite you to our next poll. Uh, and this time, based on all the information uh, I just gave you and based on your uh, general uh, feelings and knowledge about this topic and your workplace, please rate uh, the level of ownership mindset in general in your company. So the whole company, so overall, what is your impression about the ownership mentality in your company? It is one if it's non-existent and if it's seven, uh, if it's perfect. Okay, results are pouring in. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you will see that it's a very typical uh, mixed picture. Uh, very nice. Okay. Yeah, I think we can close it on Rash. What do you think? Yes, here you can see Basically, if you turn it 90 degrees in your mind, you get a bell curve. 
yeah? So it's uh, almost a normal distribution. Okay, let's move on to the next poll. So your job is not over. Uh, now let's discuss your own unit, the unit that you are working in right now, or the unit that you are managing right now. How do you read the ownership mindset in that unit? Okay, let's see the results. It started with six and sevens, but now the, the results are, are getting more interesting. Now I'm trying to do, take the role of the, the, the sports commentator. Okay, guys, in lane four, move on, move on. Nobody in lane one, come on, come on, come on, come on, okay. So we're close to the finish line, okay, let's finish. Okay, as you can see, this is, so everybody rated their own unit, or not everybody, sorry, I misspoke. The group who is present in this webinar, in general rated their own unit uh, a bit higher than the company than they, than they work for. Okay. These results actually remind me to this Hungarian joke. Maybe it's not Hungarian, but obviously I learned it here in Hungary, that uh, when you ask people whether they are above average drivers, car drivers, then 80% of the people say that they are above average, which is statistically speaking impossible that you have 80% above average. So just, just saying, okay, uh, let's move on. Here at SEED, we basically pride ourselves uh, in our programs that we aim to provide clarity during our programs, but also usefulness. So hopefully now we are a little bit clearer about what ownership behavior and uh, behind that ownership mindset basically means. Then let's move on uh, to the practical implications. So what can we as leaders and managers do about creating an ownership mindset? Or if it is already at three, four, five, six in our unit, what we can do about improving it. Actually, when I discuss this topic uh, during mentoring sessions or, or in during larger settings, many people say that basically they, they cannot do anything about it. Uh, but pardon my French, but typically I say bull when I hear these things because these are basically excuses. Uh, because uh, you can always do something, even if you cannot do everything. So let's see what I mean by everything, and then let's see what, what you can do uh, in practice. During our Foundations of Management programs, we teach our participants the so-called key managerial activities. So what managers should do in their work when it comes to managing their people. And these are basically these four things, selecting the people, setting goals, developing the people and motivating them. And uh, if managers do these four things right and do the right things, they can achieve tremendous improvements. And these are basically the broad categories that you need to operate when it comes to ownership mindset. But also let me give you uh, a little bit of a structure, how to approach the improving ownership mindset in your unit and in your companies. It has four elements. You need to work on the personal in your unit. You also need to be able to give the knowledge to the people. You need to have enabling systems in place. And last but not least, you need to have the right incentives. So let's start taking them one by one. First of all, personal. What is extremely important and is the starting point is basically the culture. You need to have the right culture. If you are managing a unit, then you are the person who has the biggest and utmost influence on the culture of that unit. Of course, you need to take into account the big company culture as well. When I joined k &H Bank, uh, I was uh, asked to improve the results. Uh, the market share in the corporate division has been declining basically for more than a decade uh, when I joined. And it 
reach the, the bottom when, when, when the owners wanted, wanted it to stop. Uh, and I looked around and I realized that the bank is an extremely good one with, with very professional people, uh, with, with pretty good ownership, very good capital position, very good liquidity position, etc., etc. Uh, so I decided, okay, let's take a look at the corporate culture because I got the vibe that it might be not optimal. And we did a, co uh, a company culture survey uh, in the corporate division and the two most characteristic words that I got from this survey was the lukewarm and the sanatorium. And these two words you just don't want to hear when it comes to a sales organization which the corporate division ultimately was supposed to be. So you need to check your culture, that's my point. Then you need to have the right people. Uh, you need to hire the right people uh, on your team. And within your team, you need to promote the right people. Uh, you need to multiply yourselves, basically. And you need those people who actually spread the gospel, if you like, within the, within the organization. So let's come back a little bit for hiring and let's see how the guys at Amazon do it. So Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon says that he, he, he just don't want a mishire. Basically, this is what this expression means. And uh, during our business leadership program, we spend a lot of time discussing this topic, how to hire the right people. And there was even a book written about this topic using Amazon as the, as the case study. There is another guy, a management guru called Jeffrey J. Fox. And he says, it's a little bit more controversial. He says, hire slow, fire fast. And the message is the same, that hiring is a very, very important decision. So how do guys do it at Amazon? That they look for the traits of ownership. And they ask questions during the interview process that they uh, think will reveal how people demonstrate ownership mindset. And if you look closely at these questions, these typically uh, tell me something what you did in the past. Give me an example. Describe the project. Talk about the situation. So these are not uh, general questions. Because if you ask me in an interview setting that, Robert, uh, do you behave as owners? Do you take care of your company car as if it was your own? I know what the right answer is. The right answer is yes, I'm, I'm like an owner. But you need to ask for stories to really reveal what is behind a general statement. Okay, after personal, I mentioned knowledge. You need to give the people business and financial knowledge. So if they don't have it, you need to teach the people how the business works and how, what their role in the business means. For example, uh, in many companies, they have this so-called orientation training or training for the newcomers, the people who recently joined. And in Trifizen, we insisted on the CEO giving the first introductory presentation to the new people, and then the business line heads uh, telling the people what the various businesses, corporate business, retail business, et cetera, did uh, in the bank, because we wanted the people to get first-hand knowledge about this. Then you need to install customer centricity in everyone. Customer centricity is not a front office thing. It's not a marketing thing. It's not a sales thing. Every business organization, uh, but even I would say that some, some uh, governmental organizations that serve the people are actually there to serve the people. And it must be in the mind of all employees that we are there for the customers. So for example, uh, at Raiffeisen, we felt it so important that we introduced the so-called T training. T stood for total customer orientation. And we sent 1,500 people through this training during a year. Because we wanted everybody in the back office, in the front office, in the support areas to know what the customer means for the bank. And you also need to have the people understand uh, the key numbers. So how the business performs, who contributes to the revenue side of PNL, who contributes to the expense side of PNL, and then what it means for the company. And people need to know what the critical business metrics are, how 
the outside world, how the media, how the owners, how the board, how top management measures uh, the performance of the company. For example, uh, in the low cost airline business, uh, the first and utmost measure is so-called cost, which stands for cost per available seat kilometer. So how many planes they have, how many seats they have, how many routes they have, they multiply everything and they measure how much it costs to fly one kilometer. And they want it to go down and down and down and everybody in the organization understands. For example, in, in, in Bizar, which we know, they, everybody understand what cask means. This should be the case in your situation, in your unit as well. Okay, we discuss personnel, we discuss knowledge. Let's move on to systems. What I mean here by systems, it's not software, it's not applications. It's how you work as a manager and what can help you in installing the ownership mindset. First of all, you need to have a, uh, a proper goal setting procedure. You need to define what the end goal is and people need to know that. Then you need to forecast what's gonna happen. So it's not enough to plan. You need to periodically forecast what's gonna happen in the business and you need to track the key numbers. Fortunately, in most large companies, you have the controlling department who does this for most of the stuff uh, that you need, but maybe in your unit, uh, it's not included. Then, then you need to come up with this, with this system. And here comes uh, the item, uh, which I always get the most controversial remarks about, open book controlling. What I mean by that, that you show the people how the business performs, how the business stands during the year. You check the forecast, you check the, fig the actual figures and you show the people what is happening. Okay, I know that in, in, in public companies, it's a little bit of a tricky thing uh, because of the, the, the rules of the stock exchange and, and things like that. But believe me, it can be done. I, I worked for companies that, that were on the stock exchange and somehow we managed to, to show enough information to the people that they felt that they know what's going on in the business. And last but not least, you need structures, systems that help you build accountability. Uh, for example, uh, at KNH Bank, uh, it was the responsibility of the before mentioned credit committee to set the prices of the loans. But it was a very, very bad practice from, from many aspects. Uh, and uh, it was very bad from the customer perspective because in a negotiation situation, we have to, had to tell the customers that, okay, you are asking for this price, but sorry, we have to go back to the bank and ask for uh, permission to give you this price. And um, it took me several months to, to push it through the, uh, the bank to establish a system when we delegated pricing authority to the key account managers uh, in the bank. Uh, and we had to put in place a very elaborate uh, monitoring system for this thing just to show top management that people are not abusing this authority and not quoting very, very low prices to the customers. Uh, but finally it worked and it worked as a system. Everybody was happy, top management was happy, people were happy and also uh, the customers were happy uh, because they got prompt, prompt responses. Okay, we discussed personal, we discussed knowledge and we discussed the system. Let's move on to the last part, the incentives. So rewarding people uh, for the right behavior. Okay, the ideal situation obviously is if you can make the people owners. So you can, if they ha can buy shares in the company, if, they have, if you have share option programs, when as a part of a bonus, they got shares, uh, things like that. These are the ideal situations, but it's quite rare. It's, it's, it's in the, the, the minority of the cases that, that we can do this. So we can move on to the less than ideal solutions. Then we link the compensation to long-term company performance. So we're trying to get as close as possible to the real, the real ownership. Uh, what was the case at, at KNH Bank that uh, 
We didn't get shares. We didn't get even shares in, in the mother company, but we created a notional share. So it's uh, an illusion of a share. And, and we tracked the performance, uh, the pre perceived share price of this notional share. And we linked the long-term uh, compensation, a part of the long-term compensation to, to the movement of this share price, both in absolute terms, so how much the share price increased, but also in relative terms. So we measured it against uh, a benchmark group of bank shares, basically. And it was very, very important part of this scheme that it was deferred, which meant that, uh, uh, for example, the bonus after 2019, so last year, it would have been paid over five years. So in 2020, from 2020 to 2024. So it, it, it would have taken five years for me to get part of the bonus for 2019. But then my motivation was more aligned with the interests of the shareholders. That's the point. Okay, let's say you, can even, you can't even do this. So then you, you turn to the okay solutions and then you make the bonus, part of the bonus, uh, based on a demonstrated ownership behavior. So it's uh, basically that you make it part of the KPIs that you expect people to behave as owners and then you grant part of the bonus accordingly. It's very, very important that you differentiate. So not everybody gets the same from this part of the bonus pool. And you have to be, uh, let's say, brave enough to use your judgment because, it, because it's going to be a judgment call uh, unless you can measure the engagement of your people on an individual basis, which is typically not the case because those surveys are typically anonymous. One important uh, message here, the point is not the money. So it's uh, monetary rewards have their limit. Uh, the point here is actually getting the people into this mindset and giving them, giving them the message through the incentive system that this thing is very important for you. It's very important for the company. Okay. So we discussed personnel, we discussed knowledge, uh, we discussed systems, we discussed incentives. Now we need to put this into practice. A warning before we put it into practice, the whole thing basically does not work if the people are not aligned with your purpose. So I think that it's, it's enough if, we, if I just refer uh, in the last couple of days, how people in Facebook, employees, at Facebook basically revolted uh, against Mr. Zuckerberg uh, because they started to feel misaligned uh, with the purpose of the company. This purpose in, in, in SEED during our business leadership program, we call it aspiration. We teach aspiration-based leadership uh, where we have the participants to actually define what their purpose is and where they want to get uh, with their unit. So let's assume, let's assume that you have uh, this ticked. Then you need to establish your baseline in terms of the ownership behavior and the ownership mindset. So you need to check what's happening within, within uh, your unit. Uh, you need to check to what extent you see the key characteristics uh, in, uh, in your unit. But you also need to be aware what the corporate culture is in the whole organization. And you need to be aware what it allows you to do. I mentioned this, this uh, corporate culture survey at KNH Bank, which I did. And based on the survey, I also initiated a change process. And I had very little luck with that change process. I have to admit, it was not a success. It was not a roaring success. It's dubious whether it, if it was a, even a success because I got so much resistance from the company as a whole that I could progress extremely slowly with the corporate culture change initiative. Okay, after establishing the baseline and bearing in mind the corporate culture, you establish your realistic target, so where you want to get your team, and then you create your plan. 
along this uh, structure I mentioned personal knowledge systems and incentives and you set the target where you want to get to and by when and then you act so basically start implementing your plan uh, but I also here want to give you a kind of uh, food for thought how to act I'm using uh, Stephen Covey's uh, principle uh, about his circles uh, which I learned from his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And let's imagine that this uh, dark part of the screen is the word. I don't mean that the word, word is a black and, and, and uh, cold and dark place. This is just how it came out. But let's say, say that that's the word or word. And let's say that I want to uh, improve the ownership behavior in, in, in my unit, in, in KNH Bank. And I want to set it as a, as a KPI uh, in the bonus structure. Okay, uh, there are rules in the bank about this, and it concerns me uh, that the bonus uh, scheme in the bank is a capped one, which means that uh, however big the profit is uh, in the year, the, the bonus cannot be unlimited. It is capped. It has an upper limit. I cannot change it. Uh, I have to accept it. I cannot even influence it, uh, that it is capped. There is another rule uh, in the bank that the bonus uh, compared to the target bonus has to stay within a band, has to stay within a narrow band, cannot deviate 20% up or 20% down from the, from the target. This part, although I can influence. I, I could go to HR and I could convince them that, okay, let me widen uh, this band and grant more bonus to the good performance and less bonus to the bad performance. And finally, there is an area which I could control. And that was my judgment. So it was within my purview to say that, okay, guys, 20% of your bonus is based on your demonstrated ownership behavior, or 30% of your bonus is within, within uh, my purview to say that, that it's up to your demonstrated ownership behavior. So please be uh, aware of these circles. Try not to think about anything that's outside your sphere of concern. Focus on the control, the influence, and the concern circles, your efforts and, and your activities. By the way, I mentioned demonstrated ownership behavior because you cannot observe mindset. So you, I could not set it as, as the bonus KPI. I had to set the behavior as the, as the KPI. Okay, we are coming to the end uh, of this presentation. There is a little bonus content for you. So what can you do if you can just do a small step, a baby step, as a starting stepping stone um, in this topic? And uh, some consultants in the United States came up with this idea. They called it the Florence Challenge after Florence Nightingale, uh, the famous nurse uh, who was arguably the best nurse in her time. And the challenge says that people commit to these traits that you can see on the, on the screen, that they will be only fully engaged and self-empowered. That for me, especially very important because uh, I learned in, in elementary school that if you multiply zero with however big a number, you end up with zero. So if somebody is, is not engaged and not empowered, uh, you cannot make them uh, be that. You need something already inside them uh, to, to improve on. Uh, so you can do this. So you can take this Florence challenge to your people and show them that, guys, we can behave like that. What do you think about that? Maybe you are curious about this pickle pledge in the emotionally positive category here on the screen. So let me show you what they meant by that. So you, do can, you can create a pickle free zone uh, in the office when there is no gossiping, there is no complaining, there is no criticizing, and there is no negativity. Only positive things happen there. And you can ask everyone to leave these negative things at the door. Okay. My parting thoughts before we turn to the questions uh, that uh, you may have. We as leaders are the owners. So we are constantly under the magnifying glass for our people. And 
we have to behave as owners, whether we like it or not, because we are the example for our people. So we always need to term long term and we shall not sacrifice the long term for the short term results, because this is what people would see in us. We need to act on behalf of the entire company beyond our own team. For example, uh, when finally at KNH Bank, they approved the project for the new corporate uh, internet banking solution, we immediately launched the project. Six months before that, retail banking had already started on the new retail banking, uh, retail internet banking project. And my team started to put together everything for the kickoff meeting for our project. And when I went to the kickoff meeting, they presented what they wanted. And there was not a single mentioning of the ongoing retail internet banking project. And my people thought that I was crazy when I asked them to go back to the drawing board, go talk to the retail people, go talk to the IT people and check if we can use, if we could use what they already uh, developed in, for the retail internet banking. So we need to think about the entire company, not just our own units. And last but not least, we can never say that's not our job. So that's for us as leaders. And now I'm happy to turn to your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. Um, actually, we already have two questions. One was sent to me privately by Jacques. Uh, let me quote, okay? I firmly believe that performance when meeting or exceeding expectations should be rewarded via financial and non-monetary rewards. But I do not believe that ownership mentality in itself should be rewarded. Isn't ownership mentality rather a key contributor to the corporate culture? Do you agree or disagree? Uh, yes. The answer is yes. Actually, uh, I fully agree with Jacques that uh, mentality cannot be rewarded because you just, you, we are not mind readers. You just don't know what's inside the minds of the people. So that's why uh, in my last example, before last example, uh, talking about uh, using KPIs as part of the bonus scheme at KNH Bank for ownership, uh, I deliberately decided to reward ownership behavior uh, because I didn't think I could measure mindset. Uh, and that's why it would have been unfair to, to, to measure, to, to reward mindset. I was fairly okay and confident that, that I could uh decide whether the behavior was ownership type enough uh, if you take my meaning in the people and at the beginning uh, at the beginning of the year when we discussed the kpi set for the year i told them that uh, what i think ownership behavior looked like and i also told them that guys i'm sorry but this is the thing that will be judgmental so it will be my personal uh, decision to what extent you behaved as an owner and to what extent I, uh, you, you came under par. Uh, they didn't like it, especially because in that bank, the, the, the bonus scheme was kind of uh, very arithmetical. So everybody during the year, before I, I, I introduced this thing, actually during the year, they could calculate months by months how much bonus they already earned because everybody, everything was based on, on, uh, on business figures. So they didn't like this, but, but I, I told them that guys, this is not a beauty contest. If, the, if you don't like it still, this is my decision for this year. And one more thing is that uh, I think it's okay to, me uh, to measure and reward behavior long-term because I, I do not really think that people very long-term can fake it. You know, you have, they have this uh, saying that uh, you fake it till you make it. Uh, but I think it it's only works in a way that people fake it and those who actually can change their mindset, continue doing it, but not faking it. So that from then on, not only their behavior is ownership type, but also their mindset is getting 
uh, into the into the right and the rest who could not get the right mindset uh, I think they will eventually leave because it's a lot of uh, investment of energy to fake it to 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 play a role to act all day it cannot be done long term in my opinion thank you um, one question from Attila uh, can you hear me Yes, I believe. Okay. So how can the ownership competency mindset and employee engagement be measured or tested in the most useful way? Um, is it survey or there's another better solution to that? Um, and there's also the question of how regularly should you measure this? Uh, I think directly it cannot be measured. The, the best proxy I found is this engagement, um, which we discussed earlier. Um, but those measurements are typically company-wide. Uh, the most granular that we did was at KNH Bank, which went down to the branch level, which meant about uh, a dozen or more people. Uh, that was the lowest level that, that, that we measured. And it's very, very useful to gauge the situation in general, especially when you establish your baseline and also when you, when you check back what's happening. Uh, typically, it's done yearly. Uh, it can be done more frequently, but more than semi-annual, I don't think it makes sense. I think it would be a waste of money and time. Individually, it, it just doesn't work because people only answer these questions more or less honestly if it's anonymous. Uh, so it's, it's up to us as uh, managers to observe more people. So that's, that, that basically you cannot spare this type of effort uh, that you that you that you that basically we do that all the time actually uh, this is just another aspect or which we bear in mind uh, when we are uh, working with our people talking to our people observing uh, our people and uh, typically for example uh, at um, in, in in my uh, positions it was very visible when I went to uh, customer visits with my people. And when I saw how they talk about the bank to the customer, that was, for example, quite a visible sign uh, to what extent they, they really feel the bank as theirs. Because this is what you are looking for, that, that your people feel the company as, as, as theirs. And uh, one more thing that, that's really, really helpful is you practice feedback very frequently. Uh, which is a big mantra for us here at SEED uh, to provide feedback continuously as much as possible because when you see the opposite, so when you don't see the ownership behavior in a, in a given situation, then you immediately can, can give feedback uh, to the people that, okay, this is not how I would expect you to communicate with the customer, for example, about the bank, just to give an example. Okay, we have an interesting question from Stoyan, actually. Uh, he's asking, you know, the engaged part of the team, as you referred to, are the so-called stars. Um, and he says, between the stars are the lion. And how can you manage the situation if you have too many stars and lions? So it's a highly competitive arena. Uh, okay. I, obviously, I'm not familiar with the, the, the concrete situation. So the way I understand the question is that, that you have some, uh, let's maybe say, uh, narcissistic people among your stars or, or people who, who think they are untouchable because of the contribution, the, the great contribution that they make uh, to, the, to the unit. Uh, if this is the situation, then, then it's, it's a, a typical managerial challenge, in my opinion. Uh, to what extent to allow uh, destructive behavior? Uh, and, and in my opinion, long term, we are better off with a high performing team, so a team of stars, if you like, than with a team that overall performs. Uh, only a little bit higher because we have this lion. Because I think that's only temporary. 
because if, if uh, the treatment of the lion is, is, is not fair by the leader, then your stars eventually will lose their motivation and may even leave you or, or your company because of the, of the treatment that they feel is, is unjust or unfair, let's, 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 say, let's say unfair. Otherwise, if it's, if it's a high performing team with, with lots of stars, that's the best case you can get. Uh, but but um, in a team setting, everybody needs to check their ego uh, to some extent, in my opinion. Okay, um, Rob, there, there, some things came to my mind as we were preparing for this presentation and this topic, and you know we had some discussion about, and we we have talked about uh, some some non-monetary. Uh, incentives, but um, so in your experience, um, is there a single most important non-monetary uh, incentive uh, that we can introduce as leaders to create the ownership mindset we're looking for? Uh, it's a people business, so and and we know that uh, everybody, every so people are different, so. One thing may work uh, with, with many people and, and, and does not work uh, some other people. So it's a, it's a tricky question uh, for which there is no canned uh, answer. In my experience, uh, the accountability part worked uh, the best. Uh, so if I think back, uh, Raiffeisen Bank, uh, had always been for me uh, uh, a type of workplace where, where most of us felt and behaved uh, like owners. And the, the main reason for that was because, uh, loosely saying, we were left alone to do our job. Uh, strictly speaking, or more seriously speaking, that we were uh, kept responsible, uh, but left independent to approach the job at hand. So it was up to us how to do our job. We had tremendous uh, freedom uh, how to do the work, both from the owners, from the Austrian owners, and, and also from, from the top management. So for example, when I, first promote, when I was first promoted to, to middle management, uh, my impression was that 80% of the, the, the decisions that were related to my, my, my department, I, I had the authority to make those decisions alone without consulting uh, my superiors. And the rest, 20%, I was the one who prepared uh, the, the, the applications for, for those decisions. So, so in that bank, I, I, I had always felt that uh, if I was doing my own company. And I think that's, that's, that's very important. This, it's, it's a trust issue, it's, a, it's responsibility, accountability, and, and independence in, in combined together. Okay, I, I think we have one last question. One last question from Roland. Uh, let me quote Roland. Uh, what would you do if your owner partner is a barrier to growth? Um, how would you motivate him if you are equal in the company? Uh, what is, do you have any experience in, in that kind of situations? Uh, not directly. So I, I, I have never been in such a situation. Um, there is a saying, an American saying, which Roland I don't think we like, unfortunately, uh, that uh, the only ship that doesn't sail is the partnership. Uh, which means that if you have uh, owners with equal stakes in a, in a business and there are conflicts, uh, there may be conflicts that are extremely difficult to, to resolve. Uh, in this situation, uh, okay, it's almost like a coaching, coaching type of situation, what to do in the, uh, with this uh, co-owner. Definitely, I, I think definitely you need to talk to this guy about this. So it, it has to be put on the table that in your opinion, I mean, I'm talking to Roland now, 
that you, 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 you believe that the company could go faster and, and could become much bigger. And you see uh, challenges to this. And I think you should ask questions, how, how the guy sees the situation, how he sees the challenges or obstacles and how you together could, could resolve this. So I, I definitely would not attack this guy that, that you are the impediment of our growth. So it's, it's, it never works because it puts people on the defensive. Uh, but if you are over these discussions, uh, I don't think it can be one discussion. So if, you are, uh, if, if these discussions are beyond you and, and there was no uh, result, then ultimately I think you should consider uh, funding another company. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have any further questions uh, that you would like to ask maybe later on, uh, you can send us an email. Uh, directly, uh, and we and Robert will answer them also directly. Uh, following this session, you will um, you will get an email with all the details, and of course, as usual, the slides and the video recording of today's webinar today's webinar will be available early next week on our website. And now, Robert, please move to the next slide uh, because I would like to ask and invite you to do the last poll, which is how did you feel today? from one to seven, please just hit a number. And this is uh, a really good feedback uh, to us on your behalf. Please vote now. Okay, we still have some people who have not voted yet. Okay, just a few more to go. Please hit a number if you haven't. So if not, I am now closing the poll. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, next week we will have uh, Istvan Pop on Thursday at 4 p.m. as usual. We look forward to seeing you. Um, and Istvan will talk about managing remote sales teams not just now but after the crisis so um, it will be a very interesting topic so hope to see you uh, next week same time and now uh, enjoy the weekend uh, let's hope there's no more rain and you can enjoy sport do, doing some sports outside so thank you very much and uh, see you next time thank bye bye you. bye, -bye.